Yeah, look. Boy, you're all out of focus today. More coffee, I think. Any, anyhow, I'm Stephen Levine. Some of you know me. Probably all of you know my name by this point in time since I've been around OS2 for quite a while. Anyhow, what we're going to talk about a little bit is what happens when you have a problem. This is, this is more of a source book than how to fix anything. Because usually but with OS2, when you have a problem, it's never simple these days. So anyhow, first thing we always start with is exception reports. Got a couple types of them. Basically, you've got the process exception report, which is when your application has a problem. And then you've got your kernel exception reports. These have no, they're given several different type of names. You'll hear a term called IPE. You'll hear them called the kernel exception report. You'll hear them called raise zero traps, all that sort of stuff. Now, these are the ones that are sort of built into OS2. But OS2 allows an application and, and not so much, but even a driver to do their own exception reporting. Now, if you see one that looks like this, the one that says process exception reports here, Roger? Yeah, you got the process exception report, that screen up? Yeah. That one's generated by the kernel. And you've probably all seen them here and there. Basically, you need access to the source code or other debugging data to figure out what's really happening because all you got is the registers. Kernel IPE is similar, but because it's it's just the kernel, it tries to give you a little bit more information that it knows. Those two little funny numbers down on the bottom, the 6,000, comma 9084, if we actually had access to the uh, kernel source code, that would tell us the file and the line number that's failing. Unfortunately, we just sort of have to infer from history what those mean. And like the process report, it's just registers, so you really got, you need other sources of information usually to fix to fix it. Now, most of the problems we have these days sort of are not new. So a lot of times you can just look at the CSCIP and do a Google for that. And if you find it, you may find, and if you find it in Google, you may find a solution for your problem because it's happened before for someone else. Now for application reporting, what we try to use these days more often is the accept queue exception report. Over the last several years, it's, it's used a lot. If you're using the new Mozilla betas and, the, and Mozilla and Firefox traps on you, you'll, you'll be asked for the accept queue report. And what this is basically is a mini process dump with the information that's most useful. And it's formatted already which means the programmer doesn't have to format it themselves. And they're very helpful. Now, as I mentioned, applications can do their own. And accept queue is an example of an application doing their own. We implemented it as a shared DLL, and the application checks to see if that DLL is available and hooks into it if an exception happens. But there are other forms. For instance, GCC has their own exception reporting system, or KYC, if whichever you want to call it. And that's both good and bad. If you look at it and compare it to the process exception report, there's actually less information in there, which sometimes is annoying from a programmer's point of view. The other problem is that because it's only written to the screen, if you're running a GUI app, You'll, you won't even see it. So you have to take uh, special action and redirect your, your output to a file if you think you're going to need it. Now, this is less of a problem than it used to be because apps like Firefox and all that, they are KLibs apps. But because they use the accept queue report, they intercept the exception before KLibc sees it, and then they get a better report. There are others that hanging out there. Every now and then, uh, you'll be using your desktop and you'll hear a beep. And often that means that eWorkplace or XWorkplace has de detected an exception and written a report. 
Now, the interesting thing about its workplace, new workplace, is that it tries to recover and continue after the exception. It doesn't always, sometimes you have to restart the desktop, but it's one of those features of exception handler that a lot of people don't see. There's one I think I'm going to be taking this one out. There's the Intertech font library exception report. Now, the font library is not used as much as it has been in the past, so we don't see them. But basically, if it traps, it writes an exception report that looks like a pop-up log exception report and leaves it in the current and leaves it in the direct in some directory. Usually, it's in the root of the boot drive, but I found them elsewhere. But if you're still using that and you have font problems or something like that, it's not a bad idea to go looking for it. So that's basically an overview of the exception reports. There's there's a few others around, but they, you won't see them very often. Any questions? Don't speak okay. Or you can answer them. <laughs> no, I'm sorry, you're, you're, break, no, you're, you're breaking no, up a little bit. There were no questions here. Sorry? Sorry? There are no questions. No, no good. good. Okay. okay, next thing that we look at is tracing. OS2 has a built-in trace facility. And there are a couple third-party apps that add variations on this. Now, these days, the major use you're going to have for tracing is if you're using one of the newer Arc NOAA drivers or one of the drivers done by some of the other people, uh, they're going to have tracing built in. One example is typically the USB drivers. And the uh, troubleshooting guide that's specific for the USB drivers, for instance, tells you how to turn it on and how to configure it for a specific driver. The useful part of tracing is that it's basically at speed and it's very and it's not very intrusive so often if you have a problem you can turn on the tracing and you won't change the uh, conditions and the problem will still be there the bad part of tracing is the tracing is done in memory so if you your system crashes while you're doing the tracing you, it's very difficult to get, to retain that data there are, there are ways of doing it, but it's typically not easy. Now, for third-party applications, there is a tool called OS2 Trace by Dave Blatsky, who's a probably retired by now, but a long-time OS2 programmer. And basically, what he did is he built a whole bunch of DLLs that, replace, that hook into the standard DLLs, and they provide very, very comprehensive API reporting. They'll give you the input values to the call, the output values, and if there are buffers, they'll dump the buffers with some formatting. And it's really handy for certain types of problems. The down, it's more intrusive than the OS2 trace because you actually modify the executables. But but often the output is so much better than what you get out of the OS2 trace that it's just worthwhile. Then there's another application out there, tracing application called PMSpy. And basically, some of you probably are aware that OS2, the GUI, and the PM is all message-based. And what PMSpy does is it has the ability to capture these messages. It's very low level, so it's not really end use. It's not really an end user tool. Now the thing is, is things like uh, OS2 Trace, even though it's a little hard to use for end users, it actually can be an end user tool because the output is so readable. Tracing. There's a couple other tracing tools out there, but they're pretty much little used. And uh, if a if a developer needs to use them, he'll tra he'll give you the documentation when the time comes. OK, that's it for tracing. Next thing I'd like to talk about a little bit is logging, as long as there's no questions on the tracing. Yeah, logging is, is a generic term. 
And I like to say that, you know, it's, there's very little difference between logging and tracing. It's almost point of view sometimes. Now, OS2 has a built-in logging facility, but an awful, a lot of applications have their own logging facilities that are customized to what they need. For instance, Mozilla has one, eWorkplace has one, uh, GCC KYC has one, TCP IP has a syslog facility, but technically that's not really a logging facility, that's really a data capture. The application already has to be writing to syslog, and syslog is the uh, tool that captures it and saves the data to files. And then for, since we still use it a little bit, there's the Intertech font library log facility. If, you're having tr if you happen to be using an application that still requires the font library and you have font problems, that's the one you're going to look at. System log every facility is, it, I've, it's not something I would consider very useful. I think I, the, it, the IBM internal guys probably had more use for it because they had better access to uh, getting the data formatted. It, like the system trace, doesn't really format capabilities. So unless you have access to IBM internal data, it's there, you can look at it, and sometimes it helps, but usually you end up having to do something else to solve your problem. The Mozilla log facility, that is something I actually need to go back and look review again. At one point in time, there's a whole lot of built-in logging that you can turn on, turn off, and things like that. But I have a feeling, and I was that that a lot of that is sort of gone. The tool, tools are still there, but I can't find the current documentation of how to use it at the application level. I can find documentation on how to use it at the developer level, but that's not as much fun for end users. Okay. KYC has extensive logging built in. If you need to use that, the, probably the developer is going to tell you to put in the logging version of, cable, of the DLLs because the logging is not is very intrusive and slows things down, so it's not in the normal DLLs. There's, there's debugging DLLs which turn on the logging, and the logging there is very high level. So it's very useful if you have something that you've got an something that you need to see what order things are done, or there's some piece of data that uh, is not getting, the error that GLibc is reporting is not sufficient. Okay, syslog, as I mentioned, it's, it's basically the reporting method. And syslog is everywhere. It's actually nothing that's specific to OS2, it's actually specific to most TCP IP stacks. They allocate the UDP port and the applications write to the UDP port and the syslog facility simply is watching for messages on there and stashing them away in the, sys in the various uh, logging files. Now the thing that's useful about syslog is you can slice and dice pretty a lot. They, they have what they call deep logging levels and facilities. So you can get all the logging information, let's say for rsync, to go to a simple to an rsync log, as opposed to having a single log file where you have to go break everything out. And the font library, I'm going to sort of skip that because we just don't use it enough. If you if you need it, and you think you need it, you know, talk to a developer, or drop me an email. Okay, let's talk a little bit about process dumps and dumps. One of the problems we mentioned about the the, the pop-up log that you get from a standard process dump, it's just registers. And it's, just, and it's not enough a lot of times to figure out what's going on. So what's built into OS2 is something called the process dump facility, which is our application and stores the data away in a file. And then there are tools for looking at those files and analyzing them. Faint of heart. You almost you have to be a developer to be able to get much done with them usually. But it's good to know that they're there, and it's also good to know how to capture them because it's your machine that's got the problem. 
Another type of dump is what's called trap dump. The dump is the type of dump that's generated when the kernel has a problem. Now, these are sort of nasty because they have to be written to a, they're a standalone partition, which can be either fat, and it's got to be a fat partition, and it's got to be relatively small. And if you were too big and we start having troubles. So it means if you have a four gig memory system, you may have troubles. However, we have some tools for that if they're needed. These days, we don't see too many trap dumps except while we're debugging, which is a good thing. But again, like the process dump, it's good to know they're there. Now, once you have one of these files, the tool for analyzing it is something called the process dump formatter. And basically, it's a tool that understands the format of these dump files and gives you what almost looks like a kernel debugger interface into these dump files. So you can do things like dump the locations of memory, dump the stack, uh, just do various masks, search for things. But again, definitely pretty much a low-level programmer tool. Okay, any question on dumps and process dumps, trap dumps? Well, I might have one suggestion for you to take, to, to put that in your, um, in, your doc, in your documentation. I've noticed that when you make a trap dump. Um, I'm so sorry, you're breaking up a little bit. Uh, never mind, then the upstream audio channel here is too bad for, for you to hear us. No, that's better now. Now it's better. If you make you want to ask your question? If, if you make a memory you dump and you don't have early mem in it equals true in your config sys, and the system tracks when it's still loading base step or device drivers, you actually still get a 16 megabyte memory dump. And in, in a lot of cases, kernel dumps occur when, it, when the system is still initializing. So that might be useful for people who have more than, than two gigs of memory and who are not capable of making a dump to a two gig fat partition. Yeah, yeah that, that is true, true. but even if you have a four gig system, system we have workarounds for the problem. problem. I've prepared patch loaders, loaders that will, even, even if you have a four gig of physical RAM, RAM it'll, it'll report your system as only two gig, gig which means you'll only get a two gig, gig dump. Okay. And, and those usually work. work. So, so if you happen to need a trap, a process, excuse me, a trap dump file for a system with four gig, you know, contact me or contact one of the other developers and we can help you set that up. These days, we aren't getting that many trap dumps out of the drivers, just, you know, they're just, the code is getting better. That's all I can guess. And, you know, we've got more, and we've got all of the little, most of the easy problems solved. The type of things we see these days with drivers is just these oddball devices that, oh, in the case of USB, don't want to connect quite right. And sometimes it's our code, sometimes it's the hardware itself is just not the best because it's all USB hardware is so cheap in general. But we're working on that sort of stuff. But again, if you need a, if you have a, a, too much RAM for the trap dump, just talk to us. Anything else? No. OK. Now we get the system, the system analysis tools. These actually are almost end user friendly, some of them. Because, for instance, uh, with they, the one I use a lot, which I really recommend people play with a little bit and just get a feel for what's there, they, is Thesis. And one of the things it does is it allows you to look at how much RAM each process is using, which is very useful because there's a lot of things. Often you can do something to fix that. And also, given the way OS2 works, if one process uses too much memory, that can often affect the entire system. So it's just something that's easy information to get with the linear memory map, and it's there. Another one, which is an oldie but goodie, is PSTAT, which pretty much is, eh, it, I should probably, I'm starting to think about taking it off the list because there's better tools now, such as Go and uh, Top for this. But PSTAT just lists all, 
a combination of the programs you got running plus the DLLs that are loaded and gives you an overview of your system. Another tool that I use a lot and is you're often wondering, okay, what files are in use by the system? Well, there's a command line application called PS Files. And it's useful, especially if you, you can't get some, uh, you've got a drive locked and you can't figure out what's got it locked. PS Files will tell you which files are open. Then you can go back and figure out which application is hanging, is holding onto that file. PSMs does the same thing for semaphores, but that's not as useful because it's very hard to relate that stuff back to uh, a given application. Then there's our top, which is handy because again, that, that is most useful for figuring out why your system is busy. Because it'll actually give you a little line graph showing you how much of the, of the used system time and processor time a given application is using. Then there's Go, which uh, most of you have probably used as a process killer more than anything else. But it's also good, for, it's also got some other analysis facilities in there. Then there's a little known tool called SID2, which basically is capable of dumping almost everything the, process, the, the kernel knows about uh, ring, a Ring 3 application. And it's pretty well formatted. It's a combination of the semaphore list, the open file list, the threads that a given process is running, and a bunch of other stuff. So take a look at it. It's available on Hobbs. It's available in, in a couple other places. And then there's CatH. CatH, we usually, we, most of us are using it for rebooting. But it also has the ability to list your processes and their states. And it lists them a little better than top does for certain types of problems. For instance, if you think you have a pro one of your processes not dying, it'll give you a better look at the status than top, that top than top does. A little rougher in terms of output. It's not as formatted as nicely, but the information is there. And that's pretty much it for system analysis tools. There's a couple others coming on. There's somebody that's coming. Oh. There's somebody that just released something called SL100, and I can't remember its name. And that may actually be a useful tool once it stabilizes a little bit. Right now, we keep seeing uh, new versions pretty quickly. And that's it pretty much for system analysis tools. Any questions? Nope. OK, just to finish up. Yes, he has a question. Are all the tools available on Hobbs? Is what available on Hobbs? Are all the tools available on Hobbs? Actually, they should they should be. Additionally, the Faceus is on your ECS CD. P status ships with OS2, as do PS style files and PS SEMs. Top is available on Hobbs. Goes available on Hobbs. SID2, I believe, is, and CAD H, of course, ships with OS2 or ECS. And if they're not, we should probably arrange to get them uploaded because there's no reason they can't be uploaded there. Just if they're not there, no one's, it hasn't been done yet. Anything else? Okay, just, just to, to finish, finish up, up, a couple things about the buggers. There's a bunch of them, and if you're a developer, you may you should know they they exist. If you're a user, eh, it can't hurt to know they're they're going to exist, but you're probably never going to use them. The one, although that's not entirely true, I've had with the kernel debugger, I've had cases where I'll have set up an end user to run the kernel debugger for me because I don't have access to their physical system, and the only way to get the data is via the kernel debugger. The kernel debugger is a little less useful than it used, used to be because most a lot of these newer systems don't have serial ports. And we're looking at some way to solve that. We're not sure how we're going to do it yet. Then in terms of the other debuggers are really mostly ring three. 
There's the open Watcom debugger. Visual Age has a debugger. The Visual Age debugger is the one you're most familiar with, and it's the one we actually use for debugging Mozilla these days. And then there's the ICAT debugger, which is a combination of a kernel debugger and a source level ring three debugger. It was intended to be the next generation of the kernel debugger. But unfortunately, when IBM stopped doing development uh, 20 years ago or so, you know, it is what it is. It works, but it could use some new other facilities. And, it's a, and it could be a little picky to get attached. And that's pretty much it for debuggers. Another tool that uh, if you ever are trying to do any development, you might find useful is a disassembler. Reason B is we don't have source code for a lot of stuff. So your choice is to go use the, take a, generate a dump file and disassemble in there, or just use the disassembler to get a, a version of the source code that you can look at and browse, or not the source code, the machine language that you can look at and browse. And for that, we've got PMDF, which I mentioned before for the dump formatter. It's got a built-in disassembler. Then there's a tool called IDA, which is Interactive Disassembler. And that's been around for a long time, and that does a pretty good job. And then our friend Thesus actually has a disassembler in it too, which is sort of handy because you actually can disassemble the code in the live system. Again, these are programmer tools, developer tools. And that's it pretty much for debuggers and assemblers. I assume there's no questions, right? <laughs> okay, a couple final thoughts. Can't hurt, even if you're an end user, to go find a copy of the OS2 debugging handbook, which is on your ECS CD, and just browse it and take a look at it, because it's got some nice pictures that will give you a better idea of how the operating system that you're using is actually structured and why it works the way it works. And then... I've got a link here to my Diagnostic Tools page, which has some of the stuff I've mentioned above, plus some other stuff. Can't, and as usual, as I always say to the end users, join the developer community. Even if all you want to do is make your machine crash and make the developer work hard to fix it, that's a good thing. Because what I always say is if, the, if I don't see a ticket for a problem, the problem doesn't exist. And with that, I think I'll leave you.